All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Onward and Upward. This time coming to you live from Fresno. I'm up here on church, and uh, she's over there, and uh, she's waving right now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's good to, good to see y'all. Uh, hopefully this works. We've had some weird uh, internet connectivity issues today. Uh, worst case scenario, I will still get the audio and uh, upload it if, if all else fails. Uh, but we'll make sure that we, we have that for you. So again, welcome to Onward and Upward. Uh, our biggest announcement, and uh, we released the video today uh, on YouTube. We linked it on the page, and we're, we're going to start sending around text messages to everybody in the class just to remind them. Uh, that on November the 8th at 9 a.m., we're going to have a social distance service out in the lower parking lot underneath the solar panels. So what we're asking everybody to do is uh, to park near there, but leave the area in the shade open and bring your own lawn chairs and uh, or you know, whatever's comfortable for you and set up around there. And we're going to have one more class together uh, down there before we take off because that's going to be our last Sunday uh, before we uh, head off to North Carolina and we want to have one more time to be able to, um, you know, we'll have a last message. We'll have some prayer. If there's, I don't know, maybe testimony, we'll play some of my ears some singing and, um, we'll share the video. But again, that's going to be the eight at 9 AM. So that gives us plenty of time before, uh, the morning service. And again, we're just asking everybody to bring your lawn chairs so that we can, uh, be social distance uh, apart from one another. And uh, also, if there is any problem with the broadcast, like, for example, I don't have a microphone on, which cannot be the problem today. I can see that I'm talking. Uh, make sure that you message my wife as all of my stuff is set to do not disturb. Again, I have attention deficit disorder and stuff like that throws me off big time. So make sure if there's something going on, you message her so she can uh, get a hold of me and tell me what's going on. Um, we last week taught on the gold passages. We're going to, uh, I may come back and do another one of those. I'm praying about it. I'd like to do one more. Uh, but this week we're going to do something a little different. Uh, it's a standalone message. Uh, so go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Obadiah. Uh, Obadiah, you say what chapter? There's only one chapter in Obadiah. So turn to Obadiah. <laughs> and um, again, this is going to be a standalone message and not part of any series. And it's entitled Warnings When a Brother is Judged warnings when a brother is judged. When I prayed to the Lord about what he wanted me to teach about, uh, he very quickly directed me to this passage, very specifically drew my eyes to certain verses and clearly um, made a point uh, to say, this is what it is that you're supposed to be teaching on. So I'm not sure who this is for, but praise the Lord. We know that we're doing the right thing is again, I've gotten extraordinarily specific uh, leading from the Lord on this. I just need to move this over here again. I'm not on my normal confines. So Obadiah, uh, and when you get to Obadiah, uh, we're going to be starting in verse 11. Obadiah, starting in verse 11. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captives his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou has, have judged proudly in the dark of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity, yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. Uh, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be able to do this right now, Lord, for the technology that makes it possible that even though we're um, hundreds of miles away from San Diego, we're still able to have class thanks to this technology. So, Father, thank you for that. Uh, I just pray that as uh, your message goes forward, that you would speak through me as your oracle, your messenger, that whoever out there needs to hear this, that it would reach them with the way that you intended to reach them. Uh, Father, just keep my agendas apart and separated from this so that I wouldn't in unduly influence your message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Uh, Bill Hillman is a, a man who is still alive. He's actually only one year younger than me, so he's not even that old. And Bill Hillman is a guy who has gone over to Spain many, many times. Now, generally, when people think of Spain, there are many things that get thought of, uh, flan, uh, for example. But one of the biggest things that people think about when you talk about Spain is the running of the bulls and the bullfights. And Bill Hillman has been a vocal uh, enthusiast of the running of the bulls and whatnot. And he spent a lot of time getting, getting really involved and familiar with it. I don't know if you all have ever been part of something where you were just, you knew the ins and outs of it enough to write a book, but he did. He got so involved in the, the running of the bulls that he actually wrote a book called uh, How to Survive the Bulls of Pamplona. Uh, Pamplona. He's, he's run it several, several times. And in all of his expertise, he has now found a way to help you know how you should act if you ever want to go with the running of the bulls in Pamplona. And I want you to keep Bill Hillman in the back of your mind because we're going to swing back to him in a little bit. Let's get a little uh, background on what's going on here in Obadiah. You need to understand with Obadiah that the, the group that is being uh, uh, prophesied against here is Edom. Edom is being prophesied against and um, basically what's happened is, is that Judah, Judah is in trouble. Judah is being taken captive. And literally what we see here, starting in verse 11 and moving through verse, verse 14, is that they stood by, did nothing to prevent it, actively participated in the problem. Point of fact. And God had some things to say about that. And the main thing that we need to remember this morning from, from Obadiah is that when a fellow Christian, because when you look here in this passage, it says brother, they call him their brother. You need to understand that, that Edom is a descendant of Esau, and Esau was whose brother? Jacob. Jacob's name became Israel. Israel and Edom were related to each other. And in that, that's why this message is called warnings when a brother is judged because when a fellow Christian is being judged by God and Judah was being judged by God, how we act is really, really important. You know, when you're in church and you've been watching that guy and you've been seeing the way he's acting and you know he's heading for trouble, maybe you try to say something and he keeps on. You know, the Bible says that a wise man seeth the evil and hideth himself, but the foolish pass on and are punished. And man, they go on and then all of a sudden they start getting, you know, corrected by the Lord. Or maybe it's, you know, whatever, any situation that you can think of. But you see that, that the Lord is trying to correct one of his children. How we act when that's happening with somebody is really, really important. And God in this passage gives us five pitfalls that we are to avoid whenever a Christian brother or sister is being judged, is being corrected, any of the above. And we, we need to pay attention to these pitfalls. So the first of the five pitfalls is that we are not to stand by and do nothing. This is seen in verse 11 and the beginning of verse 12. Uh, let's back up to verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob shall, uh, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou wast as one of them, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother and the day that he became a stranger. He's saying, hey, look, you should not be doing that. Why are you just standing there while they need help? And listen, this is a hard thing for us. It's a hard thing for us for a couple of reasons. First thing, it's, it's a hard thing for us just for the simple fact that I think many of us have good intentions, but it's one thing to see that someone's been kicked out of their house, and it's another thing to be able to help provide them a place to stay. It's one thing to see that somebody uh, has a need to go to the doctor. It's another thing to volunteer to take them there, right? It's one thing to see a need. It's another thing entirely to fill a need, especially when there's risk to you. I mean, hey, Judah being taken captive, this is a serious issue. And Edom really, if you read... Early on, you see that Edom didn't have any reason to brag. They were a tiny nation. And by the way, isn't that the way it is? People who are proud really rarely have any reason to be, right? They probably couldn't have done anything to help. 
but God still said, you should have tried. You still should have tried. Um, Edmund Burke was famously the one who said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Think about that. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. My life's motto is the words, in absentia lucy, tenebre vincent. It's Latin, and it means in the absence of light, darkness conquers. Listen, light is so incredibly powerful that just a small candle makes shadows run away. But the moment the light goes out, the darkness is... And when we see darkness encroaching on a Christian brother, whether it's a judgment or a correction or just something bad is happening, God does not expect us to just sit there and do nothing. And it may involve a risk to our person, but that's okay because God knows and sees our sacrifice. I'm not saying it's easy. It can be very scary. When God tells you that you need to financially bless somebody when you are in need of finances, that's a terrifying thing. When you know that someone is sick and you could get sick from it, but you go in to help anyway, I, I really applaud our doctors and nurses who go in and work in hospitals and these environments where they could get sick and they do it anyway. I mean, I, I'm thinking right now of Amy Allen. She had that picture on Facebook in her like ET hazmat suit. You know, that takes some courage. But all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Let's not just stand by on the side. Because the very first pitfall is standing by and doing nothing. The second pitfall is celebrating their fall. Celebrating their fall. This is found in the end of verse 12. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. All right. They were excited about it. Yeah, they're getting theirs. You know, our... our uh, we have this thing that I've I've started to notice, and I've got a name for it now. I've kind of talked about it before. I'm calling it instant karma culture. Instant karma culture. And the reason I'm saying this is because there's been two different phenomenons I've seen uh, concurrently running, especially on Facebook, where it'll say uh, something like, spoiled brat does this, gets instant karma. Man does this, gets instant karma. Or so-and-so does this and instantly regrets it. So-and-so does this and instantly regrets it. And we sit there like these sadistic little uh, uh, voyeurs watching these people suffer. And we're like, yeah, but they're jerks. They deserve it. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But why are we so excited and happy to see people be miserable? There is something seriously wrong with us when we see somebody crying and that makes us happy. Can that just sink in for a second? When someone else is miserable or crying and it makes you happy or makes me happy, what does that say about us? Does that exemplify Christ? Did you know the Bible specifically warns us not to do this? Think about this. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 17, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. That's an enemy, an outright, full-on enemy. You're not supposed to rejoice when he falls, and you're not supposed to. Uh, 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 what's the other word? Uh, you're not. Your heart's not supposed to be glad when he stumbles. That's an enemy. So what happens when it's your Christian brother, and you're doing that? There's a deeper problem there. Bitterness is a really horrible pill. An unresolved conflict frequently leads to it. And if you're harboring those, those thoughts in your, your heart towards somebody, it needs to be dealt with. Read Matthew 15 about conflict resolution in the scripture and use it. And don't go celebrating the fall and the judgment of somebody else. It's wrong. And it is a horrible reflection of Christ. And seriously, says something very bad about us. So the first warning is that we are not to stand by and do nothing. The second warning is that we should not celebrate their fall. The third warning is that we're not to assume that we're not next. 
Again, at the very end of verse 12, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Listen, if you go back in this passage just a little bit, in fact, let me find it for you. Verse three, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are the hidden things sought up? In fact, verse 2, Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. We can't just assume that we're immune. It's called presumption. Presumption is whenever we assume that God's grace is just going to cover us and we won't have consequences. The Bible says this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There's a lot of people that we just think and assume, I'll be fine. No problem. I got this. That's not going to tempt me. But it's sad how many people end up in the exact same situation that they once despised. Be really careful saying the words, I would never. Folks, we're all just sinners saved by grace if we're Christians. And if we're not, we're sinners. And we're all capable of the exact same things one to another. And there was no such thing as a, I would never. Maybe you assume you would never, but you don't know that. I can tell you after many, many years that there are pastors and preachers and evangelists that I've looked up to over the years who've done some terrible things. Men who are in jail because of things they've done. Men who just up, left everything, packed up, left their lives, ran off to another state to be with someone else who they're not married to. I'm like, you know what lesson I took from that? If it could happen to them, it could happen to me. And I should not be all proud and just walking around being like, huh, well, it happened to him, but I'm good. Where does that pride come from? Because it doesn't come from the Lord. Don't do that. He said, Brother Church, this is not your usual uplifting, peppy message. I know. But the Lord clearly wants to get somebody's attention with this. Please pay attention to these warnings. Don't just stand by and do nothing when it's within your power to do something. Uh, don't celebrate the fall of those who are being judged and corrected. Don't assume that you aren't next. Uh, fourthly, don't take advantage of their circumstances. Look at verse 13. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity, saying, look, these people were being opportunistic. The gate was broken down, which again was the main access point to the city. It was the main point of protection and guarding within the walls of the city. And here comes Edom following in uh, into this uh, city, which is being attacked. And they're coming in and they're, they're stealing from people. Kind of reminds me of what happens whenever uh, uh, some of these riots happen and people are just running into the stores and they're stealing from these people and these small business owners. Why are we doing this? It's not of Christ. And in a very real sense, you're like, okay, but Brother Church, we're, I'm clearly not doing that. No, but when people are down and when people are hurting, you can take advantage of them. Maybe you swoop in and use an opportunity to get their job position. Maybe you try to use it as an opportunity to swoop in and get someone's spouse. Oh, yeah. People can do stuff like that. Don't be an opportunist and profit off of the suffering of other people. I really think that a lot of the common culture in America right now is something that we as Christians need to look at and ask, is this biblical? Because there's a lot of hypocrisy running around right now. And we seem to have forgotten that the Lord has said in his word, whatsoever you would that men would do unto you, do ye also unto them. We call that the golden rule. 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That phrasing is not in the Bible, but that's what I just said prior was. If you wouldn't want someone doing it to you, don't do it to them. So let me ask you a question. When you're down, when you're hurting, when you're suffering, how would you want people to treat you? Treat them that way. First pitfall to avoid is standing by and doing nothing. The second is celebrating the fall. The third is assuming that we aren't next. The fourth is taking advantage of circumstances. And the fifth is to actively participate in their downfall. Look in verse 14. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those that did remain in the day of distress. Listen, what they did is when the people were fleeing to get away from the, the captors, they caught them, they stopped them from getting away, and they turned them in. And then the people that hid while the armies went away, as opposed to the people who fleed, they went in, searched them out, and, and made it worse. You say, would Christians do that? Unfortunately. And, and I feel it's really important to say this right now. Please don't stop following God because of people. We are not God. That's why I constantly tell you, don't follow me. I'm just a man. I make mistakes. I make errors. Follow God, not people. Because we do all make those errors. But man, why, why, why would we actively create problems for people? Why would we take situations and make them worse? The Bible says, "Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. Not go in and pour extra salt on the wound. There is a lot that is done in the name of God that has nothing to do with God. It's, it's mean, it's vindictive, it's, it's, it's cruel. And it's not of God. Because that's not God. God is never, ever cruel. Just, but not cruel. And really, at the end of the day, when a person is being judged who is a Christian, we need to understand that if God does not take them to heaven, then God still has a purpose for them after the judgment, which is why we need to be there to help them. And it won't be easy. There's going to be uh, issues that need to be worked through. Uh, there might be bitterness that needs to be worked with and avoided and, and helped weed it out. There just needs to be growth. There needs to be kindness. There needs to be forgiveness. Trust but verify. We need to help bring people along because that's what God does for us. That's what a good shepherd does. Pastors, our job is to go out there, and when we lose a sheep, I know that we take the passage in the Bible that when Jesus talks about the parable of the lost things and he leaves the 99 and goes after the one, we, we usually attribute that to people who are not saved. I understand that. But when you think about it, it's about losing something you already had. And when you have a member who you're losing for some reason, we need to make sure we pour our attention into them. Now, you may not be able to prevent all losses. That's just reality. But we need to try. And from my experience, most church members are starving, begging, dying for help. Let's take them, help the Lord heal them, grow them so that they can become effective, quality Christians who are engaged in the work of the Lord, who can then turn and help other people who are hurting, who are being judged, who are being corrected to live up to who God wanted them to be. But if we don't do those things, if we just stand by and do nothing, if we celebrate and are happy at the fall, if we assume that it won't happen to us, if we just if we take advantage in uh, take advantage of their circumstances if we actively participate in the downfall it's god doesn't forget those things i remind you that the bible does say that he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of my eye and god is merciful but god is also just you know what happened to edom i'm just going to 
finish reading because this is a prophecy, just a few verses. Let's just read a little bit on. Verse 15. For the day of the Lord, and when you read in the passage, the day of the Lord, that frequently refers to a day of judgment. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen as thou hast done. It shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining in the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. If you notice in this passage, Judah gets restored. Judah gets restored. Edom doesn't. Don't be that person. Choose actively to do something. Instead of celebrating the fall, sympathize. Empathize if you can. Um, never have such pride, but remain humble. Don't take advantage of the situation. Help them. And don't actively participate in their fall. Participate in their rehabilitation. See, Bill Hillman... That bull, bull, that bull fighting, running of the bulls enthusiast I told you about, wrote an entire book about how to safely run with the bulls. And you know what happened to Bill Hillman? He got gored twice. <laughs> Two times got gored by bulls. That's the expert, the guy who's telling everybody else how to do it. Got bored by bulls. Let us humbly look at one another. And in a spirit of grace and compassion and love, true Christ-likeness, say, hey, I see that you're going through something right now. I want to be here to help you. Let's figure out how to do that. You and me together to restore you to a good place, both for their sake and for ours. Let's go ahead and close this in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to bring this message. Lord, again, I don't know why in particular you wanted this message preached, who it was for, but I just pray that for whomever it was intended, maybe you just wanted me to remember that I shouldn't be proud. I don't know, Lord, whatever it is, thank you for your message from your word. And I pray that we would all take to heart these warnings that you've given from your word and that you would help us to be good examples of you and representatives of you when we see this happening so that we can help these people be restored and that your name would go forth with honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Now I've got a little confession for you. I thought this was going to be a little bit shorter message, and it was, but I did not tell you that I thought it would be shorter. Do you know why? My wife knows why because I've told her this before. Because every time a preacher says this will be a short one, it is the kiss of death on a short message. I want to say throughout all the years that I've, I've heard preaching, maybe twice when a preacher said he was going to be short, he was actually short. Every other time I'm like, buckle in, we're going to be here over time. So I didn't want to say anything to spoil it, but praise the Lord, it's a little bit shorter. Again, want to remind everybody uh, our, our big announcement, and we're going to be sharing the word through text and email uh, and uh, we're going to be trying to get people to RSVP because we want to try to see as many of you as possible one last time. We understand if you're not comfortable with coming out there in person, but again, we want you to meet us at 9 a.m. in the lower parking lot of Lighthouse Baptist Church on November the 8th. We're going to meet down by the solar panels. We're going to set up in the shade, bring your own uh, lawn chairs or whatever folding chairs you're comfortable with and set them down out there. We're going to separate, make sure we got lots of space between us so that we're not... Uh, inadvertently, um, you, you know, uh, um, uh, contributing to to the pandemic, but that we're able to stay safe. But just one more time, have a good fellowship before the Lord uh, sends us out to North Carolina. Again, I just want to emphasize that it's it's been one of my greatest privileges to be a part of your lives, to help develop you, to to teach, to preach, and to to grow you. And the Lord has grown me a lot through these things. And Nikki and and um, 
we're going to miss you all when we go. But uh, we'll see you all again soon. We're going to be back in San Diego next week, and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be right back at it. Thank you for joining us in Onward and Upward. God bless you all. Have a great weekend.